Hey, good morning, everyone. All right, let's try that one more time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much. Man, David Crowder and the band, that was amazing. Man, let's give them a big round of applause. Um, now, incredible. Uh, so gifted. But as I was observing and worshiping with them, I, I thought to myself, they're missing one person on the band. They're missing an Asian triangle player on their band. <laughs> Um, I can play that triangle so good. Come on, David, give me a chance. I will grow my beard. Uh, please, <laughs> give me a chance. Hey, uh, today I have the privilege of being able to speak to you about something called grace. And let me give you a road map of how we're going to spend our, our time together. Uh, we're going to read a passage from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. We'll spend some time kind of breaking down that passage, giving you some context so you understand what's going on. And then I want to define this word called grace. And the reason why I want to define it is because I believe that sometimes in our Christian bubble or Christian culture, sometimes we say certain words, we sing about certain words, we hear words preached about, and after a while it's possible that we use it so much it actually loses its meaning to us. I've actually had conversations with Christians and I'll ask them, hey, could you define the word grace for me? And people struggle with it. So we'll define grace. And then in the latter half of our time together, I want to be able to speak to you about four mistakes that Christians and non-Christians make about this thing called grace. Let's pray together. God, thank you again so much for the joy and privilege that it is to be able to gather, to worship, to open up your word. We pray, O oh Holy Spirit, for your presence and your power. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, amen. So the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 to 39. Listen for God's word. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Let's study the context of the story. There are three main characters in the story. Obviously, there's Jesus. There's a woman that's simply defined as a sinner who lived a sinful life. There's that emphasis on those things. We'll get to her. And then there's a Pharisee that Bible scholars simply refer to as Simon the Pharisee. For those that might not be familiar with Pharisees, they were religious leaders. A modern word to describe them were pastors or spiritual directors that help guide people in the ways of God, in the ways of Yahweh. Now over the years, Pharisees, I think, they lost their way and they became more enamored by rules and laws and codes and regulations about who's in and who's out. The story begins when Simon the Pharisee invites Jesus to his house for dinner. Now, at a first read, it sounds good. But as you slowly read more in depth on the story, you realize that Jesus is invited to his house, but there's actually not a demonstration of hospitality. Now, what do we mean by hospitality? During the time of Jesus, it was accepted, it was custom that when someone came to your house, there were three things that you ought to do. 
to indicate and show good hospitality. The first one is that you greeted everyone with a kiss. The second one was that you provided water to have their wa feet washed. The third was to have oil available to anoint their head. Now when Jesus enters this home, we learn in the story that neither, that none of these three things were provided for Jesus. It shows us that you might invite Jesus into your presence, it doesn't mean that you welcome him. Sometimes, this sounds a little abrasive, let me say it and then I'll explain it. Sometimes I've learned over the years as a pastor, sometimes the most difficult person to lead to Jesus are cultural Christians. People that might know stuff about Jesus. You might know information about Jesus. You might know sayings or words of Jesus. You might gather in the house of Jesus and yet you haven't welcomed him into your heart. And so my prayer today gently is that I want to encourage and exhort every single one of you, welcome Jesus joyfully into your life. Now, let's talk about this sinner, a sinful woman. That double emphasis. I want you to imagine how painful, how crushing it must feel for that person or for you to have your life reduced by one adjective, and it's not a good one. A sinful woman. Imagine your hopes, your family, your background, your love, your mind, your heart, your joy, your ambition, your dreams. All of that reduced by, that's a sinful person. Imagine walking into a house and everyone looks at you and the first thought is, sinful person. Imagine going to work and the minute you walk in and people say, a sinful woman, that's this woman's predicament. Now, the Bible doesn't really go into a lot of background into her story. Pastors and Bible scholars, their assumption is that she lived some sort of a sinful, suspicious life. Words like wicked or lewd or vile harlot or prostitute or whore have been used in the past to describe this woman's actions or behavior. Now here's the other thing that we should know. During the time of Jesus, it was inappropriate for a woman, let alone an inappropriate woman, a sinful woman, to approach a rabbi, to approach a teacher. And yet in this story, this is a scandalous, crazy story. This woman enters the home, does for Jesus with hospitality what this Pharisee will not do. And what is this? It is one of the most beautiful expressions of worship. There are no words, but such beautiful, profound expression of worship. This, friends, is grace. That Jesus welcomes this woman into his presence. So let's talk about grace. Here's the first question I want to pose to each and every single one of you. What is grace? Now, as I've shared before, I think some of us, we've heard this word so often that we've stopped asking what it means and how does it impact my life? A theologian by the name of Paul Enns defines grace in this way. He says, quote, grace may be defined as the unmerited or undeserving favor of God to those who are under condemnation. The Bible says that you and I, because of our sin, because of our rebellion, we deserve judgment condemnation and death. Now I know that in our modern world, it's not cool to be speaking about sin or sinner, but it's important that we're also speaking truth. And in speaking truth, the Bible says that we deserve judgment, 
condemnation and death. And what is grace? Grace says, despite what we deserve, God gave us mercy, compassion, love, and grace. He gives us the gift of his son, Jesus. That's good news. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now let me give you an illustration to drive the point. How many of you here, be honest, raise show of hands, how many of you here have had and been caught for a speeding ticket? Raise your hand. Speeding ticket. Oh my goodness. It's a bunch of sinners here. Which is true. Now, I should also raise my hand. I have also been caught for speeding several times. Okay. <laughs> And the first time I received a ticket was when I was, I think, in college many, many years ago. I was driving my first car. I think you may have heard about it. It was a 1976 Volkswagen Bug convertible. And so I'm driving this car around and I was going 79 miles per hour. Don't judge me. It's too late. At a 55 mile per hour zone. And I remember it vividly because it was so scary. The police officer comes, knocks on the window. And back then, kids, we had this thing called a manual window. <laughs> Spoiled brats. And so it takes you about five minutes to roll it down. And so I slowly roll it down. And the police officer says what? Says, may I have your driver's license and registration? And before he asked for those things, he asked me this question, do you know how fast you were going? And all people lie. No, sir. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> driver's license and registration, I, with trepidation, give my driver's license and registration. The police officer retreats to his car. After a few minutes, the inevitable happened. The police officer says, young man, here is your ticket. Now, let's just be honest. No matter how much I whine, no matter how much I complain, no matter how much I'm praying, the reality is when I receive that ticket, what transpired in our worldly sense is that justice happened. I broke the law knowingly and willingly. Now, imagine this scenario where the police officer come, knocks on the window, and after that same exchange, the police officer comes back and says, you know what, I'm going to be merciful, it's Asian American month, and that's never happened. Hopefully someday, that was last month. The police officer says, guess what, I'm going to let you go with a warning. Now what is that? As Christians, when I've asked Christians how they would define that, the majority of Christians would define that as grace. That's not grace. That's simply mercy. So what's grace in this story? It's crazy. It's nonsensical. It's incongruous. I want you to imagine a situation, a scenario where the police officer comes, does the exact same thing, recounts your transgression and says, I'm going to pay for your ticket. And then I'm going to give you everything that I have. It's shocking. My point, that's grace. It is unmerited, undeserving, amazing grace. So let's talk about the mistakes that we sometimes make about grace. Here's mistake number one. Let's just be honest. Blunt truth. It's possible that we don't think we need God's grace. Has there been a time in your life, maybe even now, where you're thinking, well, I don't need God's grace. I'm a 
good person. I pay my taxes. I don't speed. I do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not like that person. I'm not like this woman. I'm not like this man. I'm not a murderer. I'm not an adulterer. Or the list goes on. And I know that while we may think these things, the Bible is so clear. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, you might think I'm trying to kind of pound you or slam you. I actually think it's really important for you and I to be honest, to understand even just for a glimpse, the depth of our evil wickedness and sinfulness. When we think about these things, it's always easy to look outward But it's actually really important that you understand your own sinfulness. Here's why. When you understand your sinfulness, the magnitude, the gloriousness of God's grace becomes more real than you could possibly ever understand. Let me give you an example. When my wife and I first married 22 years ago, uh, and it's just great Great uh, blessing for me to have my wife with me. If it's okay, I want to introduce my wife to you. Uh, this is my wife, Min Hee. There she is. Now, some of you might know my wife is a family and marriage therapist, which means that she wins every argument in our home. Um, let me just warn you, do not look at her in the eyes. She'll analyze you. Next thing you know, you'll be sucking your thumb and then you're crying in the corner of your house. So when Minhee and I first got married, like any normal relationship, there was a time of trying to figure out the way we do things. So for example, she liked to clean or she understood cleaning was necessary. I thought it was optional. (laughs) So as an example... Uh, she felt it was important to wash dishes immediately. I love the environment and I like to wait once a month to do dishes. <laughs> Just an example. Not right, not wrong, different. Uh, another example was the way that we went about cleaning. She would say, hey, Eugene, I think it's important that uh, you clean, you vacuum. And I said, okay, great. But my whole philosophy is if I don't see it, why should we vacuum? Now, seriously, I, for me, it was rational common sense. If there's no th- anything that I can't see, why would we vacuum? And then something happened which I consider to be one of the greatest inventions in human history. You might be thinking automobile, airplane, internet. For me, the greatest invention in human history that changed the course of our marriage. Here it is. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Drum roll, please. It's the see-through vacuum. You see, prior to, my parents gave us a hand-me-down vacuum. It was an old Hoover with a bag inside a pouch and you could not see what was inside. It just grew. And then you simply threw it away. Once we purchased this at Costco, I was shocked because what appeared to be really clean... There was nothing moving on the carpet. After 10 minutes in the living room, it was just packed with grime and dirt. Upon seeing that, it changed the way that I cleaned. If you were to come visit our home after a nice visit, after we said goodbye at the door, the vacuum would come out. I was obsessed (laughs) with cleaning. Now, that's my point. If you and I, just for a glimpse, understood, rather than looking outward for evil or wickedness or sinfulness, if you and I, just for a glimpse, understood the depths of how far we are from God, the magnitude of God's grace. I guarantee you the next time we sing Amazing Grace, you are going to sing it differently. Because how glorious is God's grace. Here's mistake number two. 
we grab grace for ourselves. You see, grace isn't something that we can grab for ourselves as if to say, it's mine. I'm entitled to this. Remember, grace is undeserving, unmerited. We actually deserve death and condemnation. And so sometimes in grabbing grace for ourselves, we actually think we can save ourselves. And if we're not careful, we end up reducing Christianity to a self-help, pop psychology, how do I better myself, just give me three nice convenient points in this sermon. Now, I'm not suggesting that you can't better yourself. It's important that you and I have initiative in bettering ourselves. We should see coaches and therapists and counselors and spiritual directors. But I'm simply reminding us they're conduits, vessels, they're not our salvation. Think about pastors. Now obviously I'm a pastor and I'm grateful for the pastors that you have at your church. Pastors point the way, show the way, illuminate the path, direct us, but they can't ever save us. You see, Martin Luther, a German theologian from the 17th century, had this to say. It wasn't particularly about pastors or directors, but I think it's so appropriate. This is what he says. He says, quote, we are all mere beggars showing other beggars where to find bread. Jesus is the bread of life. No one else. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our salvation. Now, here's mistake number three. If we're honest, and let's just be honest here. We just had a great hoedown, so let's just be honest. Mistake number three is that we think someone is outside God's redemptive love and grace. There's someone, your enemy, that person, that group of people, whoever it might be. There's someone in our lives where we just go, you know what, that person is outside God's redemptive love and grace. That's what this story is about. This woman enters and I can just imagine Simon the Pharisee just shaking his head, becoming angry and upset, his heart being hardened, in his mind thinking, what audacity, how dare she. Think about this. Anytime someone is interested in Jesus, anytime someone wants to come to church, anyone, some, anyone that wants to come to know Jesus, as Christians, we should be cheering so loud. We don't have to be the gatekeepers. We don't have to be the barriers. Let people come to Jesus. And so here's this woman. And it reminds us that no sin is greater than the grace of Jesus. No mistake is greater than Jesus. No transgression is greater than Jesus. There's a man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton wrote a hymn that I just referred to earlier called Amazing Grace. Now, a lot of folks don't know that John Newton used to be a slave trader. A horrible sin, an egregious sin, despicable. And yet he encounters Jesus, experiences the grace of Jesus. He turns, repents, changes his way, and he becomes a minister. And as a minister, he writes those words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. In one of his journals, John Newton wrote these words, quote, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner. And Christ is a great Savior. So 
right now, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, someone that I know in my life, my nemesis, my so-and-so, my enemy, my parent, my child, my sibling, my neighbor, my co-worker is outside God's redemptive love and grace, let me simply, gently, pastorally encourage you, re-encounter Jesus. Jesus is gracious. Here's mistake number four. Mistake number four, it's really interesting. Let me first tell you and then let me explain it. We think we're not worthy of God's love and grace. You see, earlier on in my life, I struggled not with extending love and grace to others. I struggled with receiving grace for myself. Because I knew my errors, my follies, my wickedness, my sinfulness. In my mind, I thought to myself, there is no possible way that God could ever love someone like me. And it's possible that some of you are sitting here right now, Christian or not, that you might be struggling with self-worth. And here's what I want to share with you, and it's so important. God's love... God's grace for you is not contingent on you. God's love and grace is who God is. It's his character. It's his essence. In our worldly, earthly sense, this is why we try so hard to be lovable, to be cute, to be successful to be spiritual, whatever it might be. And it's important for you and I to know that our worth isn't on or about you. Our worth is simply because we belong to God. We belong to God. He's our Abba Father. That means each and every single one of us were created in the image of God. We bear the Imago Day. Now, let me give you an example to kind of prove this point. I know we live in a digital culture, but just show of hands here. Don't worry, I'm not going to steal your money. Um, how many of you here actually carry cash around? If you raise your hand if you carry cash around. So about half the room. Second question, how many of you actually carry a $100 bill around? Anyone by any chance? Wow, a couple of you. I'm looking at you, okay, good, good. <laughs> now, I don't want to put anyone in an awkward situation. So I specifically asked Pastor Jared if he could bring a $100 bill for me. Now, I know Pastor Jared, he's got four kids. Money is tight, I'm sure, because they're eating 14 meals a day right now. And he's been very reluctant in the other services. Give me your money, man. Okay. Come on. All right. <laughs> So here it is. Zoom in. It's the $100 bill. Okay. Now, let's be honest. If I were to ask you right now, if, who wants this money? I mean, all of us would raise our hands. That was just an illustration. Don't raise your hands. Okay? <laughs> now, the reason why we want it is because it's valuable. It has worth. Now, what happens if I were to crush it? Sorry, Ben. You still want this? Of course. You still want this? Yep. You still want this? Yeah, yeah. We're still keeping it. You still want this? Yeah, I do. <laughs> oh. You still want this? Yeah. Now, <laughs> friends, why would he still want this? Because the value, the worth has not changed. Okay, let's give Pastor Jared a big round of applause. Here you go.
This is what Tim Keller says about the gospel. The gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Rise to your feet, friends. Right now, right here, some of you are feeling like you're being crushed. You feel hammered and beaten and bruised, broken hearted. Some of you feel hopeless or you feel like you're drowning, scarred. Rocks have been hurled at you. You feel trampled upon and I want you to know your worth, your value to God has never changed has never changed. Hear these words, God loves you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, so that you and I might not perish, but have everlasting life. So come as you are. Lay down your burdens. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, Come home, you're not too far. Lay down your hurt, lay down your heart. Whether you are saying this again, or maybe for the first time today, I urge you, I implore you, say yes to Jesus. Say yes to the grace and love of Jesus. Say yes. So Father, we thank you so much for your amazing love and grace. Give us that perspective and depth from the depths of our own sin and mire, you rescued and saved us. Give us an imagination of the magnitude of your glorious, amazing grace. Change our perspective on others those that we have struggled with or our hearts have been hardened. But I pray, oh God, that each and every single person here would not exit these doors without professing again or for the very first time, yes, to the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.